Hi everyone, my name is uh, Benjamin. I'm about to enter my final year as a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. And I would like to talk to you about a project we've been working on with my supervisor, Dan Mierberg, together with Nick Bataglia and Joel Meyers. This project is about how we can do cosmology with wireless scattering of the CMB. This talk is based on a paper we hope uh, to put on the archive before the release of this recording. So if you want more detail about the analysis we carried out, uh, I encourage you to have a look at this paper. Uh, first, a brief outline of this talk. I'll first go through the motivations of this project, then explain what is Riley scattering and how it distorts the primary CMB. Uh, then I'll show some detectability forecast for CMBS4 and Planck. And finally, I'll discuss the impacts on the cosmological parameter estimation. So first of all, we are extremely lucky to be able to do cosmology in such an era where the next generation of CMB survey, either from the ground or from space, is uh, either planned or funded or uh, under active uh, consideration. This, uh, if we combine the information gathered by all these experiments, uh, will have basically mapped all the linear perturbation of the primary CMB down to the cosmic variance and up to um, L of around 5000 for uh, temperature and emote polarization. This means that we'll be able to put fantastic constraint on lambda CDM and some of its extension, but this also means that if we want to keep further constraining these models, we'll need to resort to either go to um, smaller and smaller angular scales, which is extremely costly and also um, made harder by uh, astrophysical foregrounds. Or we'll need to resort to other signals that are beyond the primary CMB1. This is the case for uh, spectral distortions of the CMB black body spectra, or to what we call uh, secondary anisotropies, which is the term that um, uh, captures all the effects that affect the CMB photons from the emission at the last scattering surface until they reach our detectors uh, on the Earth. So this includes CMB lensing by large-scale structures, um, Sunayev Teldovich effects, both thermal and kinetic in galaxy clusters, or patchy ionization, for example. Another of uh, these effects that will allow us to go beyond the primary CMB has been described in a couple of papers, but never observed yet, and that's Riley scattering of uh, the CMB. So what is Riley scattering? What do we mean by Riley scattering of the primary CMB? So uh, first, let me quickly go through what we called, uh, what, what we usually mean by recombination history. So we start with a plasma, a primordial plasma, which is made of uh, protons and free electrons. The photons are kept in equilibrium with that plasma thanks to Thomson scattering. So Thomson scattering is the scattering mechanism um, by which photons are scattered of the free electrons. And this process does not depend on the uh, frequency of the photons, which is uh, important to remember. As the universe expands, we have less and less of these free electrons since uh, uh, recombination between protons and electrons it becomes thermally favored. So more and more of these electrons end up bound in hydrogen or helium. Uh, and so the photons uh, will experience one last scattering event and, and then there won't be enough free electrons for Thomson scattering to keep them in equilibrium with the plasma. And this is what we called uh, the last scattering surface. However, the photons may also scatter of the neutral species that are formed during recombination. And this is what we call uh, wireless scattering. On Earth, this is well observed. And uh, for example, when solar photons come uh, through uh, the atmosphere and are scattered by the neutral species that are there, that is what causes the blue sky and uh, the red tinge of the sunsets. However, right, around, right after recombination, we have uh, some hydrogen and a tiny bit of helium that is formed. And uh, the CMB photons can be scattered by these uh, neutral species. And that is what we call Riley scattering of the CMB. This uh, exhibits a strong frequency dependence uh, since it scales as nu to four, whereas uh, nu is the photon frequency. 
And as the universe expands, the neutral species uh, are diluted and the photon redshifted, which means that most of the Rayleigh scattering events are still localized uh, around right after recombination, sorry. So to illustrate that, we can have a, look, have a look at these two plots. On the left hand side, you have a plot of the evolution of the fraction of free electrons and uh, neutral hydrogen as a function of, of redshift. And on the right hand side, you have what we call the visibility function, which is defined as the probability of last scattering as a function of redshift. So if we take the case for Thomson scattering, we see here that we have less and less free electrons since more of them, more and more of them are bound in hydrogen atoms until there's no longer enough of them to keep the photon in thermal equilibrium with the plasma. And this corresponds to the maximum of the visibility function, which is the last scattering surface. For Thomson scattering, this is uh, independent of the photon frequency. However, as we discussed before, for wireless scattering, uh, we need to have enough neutral species that are formed uh, in order for Rayleigh scattering to become efficient. This is why uh, the Rayleigh visibility functions are shifted towards um, lower redshift or late time. We also note a frequency dependence both in the um, height of the peak and its location. Um, this uh, shift of the visibility function can be understood if we look at the co-moving opacity of the plasma and how Rayleigh scattering makes it frequency dependent. So uh, the co-moving opacity is defined as the scale factor multiplied by the density of free electrons multiplied by the Thomson scattering cross-section. Rayleigh scattering then adds this term, which globally increases the co-moving opacity and makes it frequency dependent. So uh, we have NH, which is the um, density of neutral hydrogen, and NHE, which is the density of neutral helium. This point one factor just accounts for the fact that uh, Rayleigh scattering by helium atom is less efficient uh, than by hydrogen atom. Then the Rayleigh scattering, uh, that, that is multiplied by the Rayleigh scattering cross-section, uh, which is frequency dependent. So we saw that this increase, uh, this frequency dependent increase of the co-moving opacity is what is responsible for the shift of the visibility function. But this also leads to a damping of small scales and isotropies, both in temperature and in emote polarization. Now the shift of the visibility function has two main effects. First is that it boosts the large scale emote signals and that's because, um, because of Rayleigh scattering, uh, the local quadruple at last scattering will be slightly larger because the universe will have expanded a bit compared to the Thomson scattering only case, which is, and since the local quadruple boosts the emote signal, um, we, we observe a boost in the large scale emote signal. As we'll, in the next slide, as we'll see in the next slide, sorry. Uh, we also observe a shift in the location of the acoustic peaks, and that's because the sound horizon now is also, uh, slightly, uh, also, slightly, is also slightly larger because of the shift of the last scattering surface. We can also uh, ask what these effects mean at the power spectrum level. And, um, if we look at frequencies that are below 700 gigahertz, uh, Anthony Lewis showed in his paper in 2013 that the uh, Rayleigh-induced distortions uh, can be ca captured um, and can be modeled as a linear perturbation on top of the primary CMB. So, um, so the multiple moments at a given frequency can be written as the sum of the frequency-independent uh, primary CMB signal uh, plus this term, which is uh, which scales as new to the four, times this uh, Rayleigh-induced distortions. So now the power spectrum uh, is sourced by three different contributions that are here here uh, ordered um, uh, as a function of their amplitude. The larger one is the primary CMB. Then we have the cross correlation, which is non-zero between the primary CMB signal. Um, and the Rayleigh induced distortion. This scales as new to the four. And then we have the Rayleigh uh, 
auto spectra, so the autocorrelation of this distortion, which scales us new to the eight. Um, this effect can be uh, seen on these plots. On the left-hand side, you have the fractional difference. Uh, so how, how big is the distortion induced by wireless scattering? So we can see that at 500 gigahertz, it's um, below 3%. So it's an extremely small effect, it's extremely small corrections to the primary spectra. And here we can see the uh, plots of the correlation coefficient uh, between the primary CMB and the Rayleigh distortions in temperature and, um, and uh, polarization. So in solid line, you, it's at 500 gigahertz, and uh, the dashed line corresponds to 50 gigahertz. So we can see in both of these figures the, the boost on the large scales that I mentioned before in polarization together with the damping uh, on small scales here. And these uh, oscillations are due to the, the shift in the location of the acoustic peaks that are not the same for the primary CMB and the Rayleigh signal. So uh, to summarize what we've uh, seen so far, so uh, first Rayleigh scattering uh, of the CMB is the scattering of CMB photons by neutral species right after recombination. It increases the co-moving opacity in a frequency-dependent way, which in turn, in, in turn produces a signal that is small and highly correlated to the primary CMB. So now uh, we can wonder whether this small effect can be detected by the next generation of CMB survey. And here we'll focus on uh, CMB S4. So um, the Riley induced this, the, the Riley scattering effect can be detected in, by in by two different ways. First, we can look at the auto spectrum, but that's extremely small. Or we can look at the cross correlation between a primary channel, either temperature or emote polarization, and the, Riley, uh, the corresponding Riley signal. And this is what we've done here, where um, we have the four different possible cross correlations between primary signal, either temperature or polarization, and the Riley signal, polarization or temperature. So this gives us uh, four different um, avenues to detect Riley scattering. Um, and in black line uh, are the signal itself, uh, is the signal itself. And in um, red dashed is the signal to noise per mode for Planck. The lower panel is simply the cumulative signal to noise. So we can see that uh, Planck at the theoretical sensitivity to detect Riley scattering quite significantly. Uh, in the TT channel. And um, however, they, did, they haven't reported any detection and um, there hasn't been any detection of wireless scattering, mainly because of um, foregrounds contamination that are quite bright in temperature. Um, furthermore, we note that on polarization, there's almost no uh, signal to noise there uh, from Planck. Now, if we uh, include, if we add uh, CMB S4 uh, sensitivity, but not, we, we don't put the atmosphere contribution for now, just the white noise, we see that, of course, CMB S4 improves over Planck quite substantially um, and uh, in temperature. But uh, we also note that in polarization, which will be, uh, as you'll see, less impacted by polarization, uh, by uh, the atmosphere, sorry. Uh, we start to have some contribution of these um, two channels to the global signal to noise. And indeed, if we now turn on the atmosphere, so if we model the atmosphere contributions to the total noise of the experiments, we see that we lose almost all the signal to noise we had in temperature, but the signal to noise in polarization is less impacted. So uh, this gives us a clear avenue on how to um, go for Riley scattering, we will need to combine the small scales uh, measurements, especially in polarization from ground-based experiments to the large scales temperature mode uh, measurements uh, of um, space-based missions. So now that we have a clear idea of how we can uh, go for Riley scattering and detect it with the next generation of CMB survey, we can wonder what's the benefit of adding Riley scattering to uh, cosmological analysis. And um, if we look at uh, lambda CDM parameters and its extension, there's a couple of them that directly affect Riley scattering. The first one is the helium fraction, so uh, which is directly probed by the, ampli the by the amplitude of Riley scattering signal. Uh, 
which means that if there's more helium, there will be more Rayleigh scattering and that will be, so detecting Rayleigh scattering will help put tighter constraint on the helium fraction. However, as we noted earlier, Rayleigh scattering produces different last scattering surface and consequently fluctuation spectrum uh, at different frequency, which means that fixed length scales will appear at different angular scales for the primary and the Rayleigh scattered part of the CMB. And uh, this allow us to this will allow us to put tighter constraint on parameters on that depend on this uh, or that uh, influence these fixed length scales. So that's the case for the size of the sound horizon, or for the density omega b and omega c, or even for the uh, number of relativistic species. Uh, here are some results for a pico-like experiment where we put a a uh, cutoff scale of L max of 5000 in temperature and polarization, and we fixed uh, the helium fraction. Um, so we see that indeed the three uh, parameters, uh, omega b, omega c, and h naught, are directly improved by including Rayleigh scattering. So that's uh, the improvement that is quoted here. We also note that the remaining uh, three parameters are improved, but that's because there exists some degeneracy between all these parameters. Uh, but if, more interestingly, if we look at extension of lambda CDM, for example, if we uh, let the neutrino mass, uh, the sum of the neutrino mass are the free parameter, we note that we have some substantial improvements uh, that results from including Rayleigh scattering. And what's extremely interesting to note, in my opinion, is that uh, you can get a four sigma detection of the minimal sum of the neutrino uh, in both these cases without relying on BIO information. So that's extremely valuable because that means for a CMB only experiment that doesn't rely on any other external data set, you can get a four sigma detection of the minimal sum of the neutrino, which would be extremely interesting and a very robust and um, strong confirmation of our model. Now these improvements is due to uh, the degeneracy that, it, that exists between uh, the density of a cold dark matter omega c and the sum of the neutrino mass. So since we measure omega c better, we get a better measurement of the sum of the neutrino mass. Uh, another extension that benefit from including Rayleigh scattering is the, um, the number of relativistic species that are also improved. Although the improvement is modest, in this plot you'll see that uh, it actually it's quite a strong one. And uh, that's because here is plotted the one sigma error on an effective as a function of the effort you put in, in an experiment. So here uh, compared to PICO. So uh, an effort of two means twice as much detector or twice as long as the integration time. So to reach a 30% improvement, which is what we get from including Rayleigh scattering, uh, we would uh, need 50 times as much detector or to wait for 50 times as uh, long uh, compared to PICO. And that's because the um, most of the constraining power on sigma and effective uh, for the primary CMB come from uh, small scales and isotropies that are exponentially damped in the primary CMB. So Rayleigh scattering opens a new window that, uh, to help further constraining um, and effective. The small caveat on this work is that we have neglected foreground contamination, but here are some, uh, there are some key aspects of uh, Rayleigh scattering, some key properties that uh, we think will help us to distinguish it from astrophysical uh, contamination. And that's its strong and unique frequency scaling together with its correlation with the primary CMB. Also, it's an extremely un well understood and modeled uh, effect, so it should uh, be able to use in parametric component separation code. So to conclude, Rayleigh scattering is a weak yet robustly predicted signal in the sky. Its first detection is pretty much uh, should be achieved by the next generation of CMB survey, and future space mission will be able to use this signal to put tighter constraint on lambda CDM and its extension, namely the sum of the neutrino mass and the number of relativistic species. However, foregrounds will need to be carefully dealt with, and component separation will play a cr crucial role in in a first detection. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, hearing, answering your question at the live discussion session. Thank you.